Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Fundamentals of Heat Pipes, sponsored by Advanced Cooling Technologies and TechBrief Media Group. I'm Barry Hurley, Associate Editor with TechBrief Media Group, and I'll be your moderator today. Our webcast will last approximately 30 minutes, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, you may submit it at any time during the presentation by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenters will answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Those questions not addressed during the live event will be answered after the webcast. Also, twice during today's presentation, we will present you with a poll question, and we invite you to answer those questions when they appear. In order to view the presentation properly, please disable any pop-up blockers you may have on your browser. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Pete Litt, Vice President of Technical Services for Advanced Cooling Technologies, joined ACT in 2010 to head ACT's technical services business. During his time, the group has successfully provided thermal consulting, design, and prototyping solutions to commercial customers in the lighting, renewable energy, industrial equipment, medical, and other industries. Throughout his career, Mr. Ritt has successfully managed numerous new technology projects in a variety of industries. He is a former RCA executive where he was responsible for developing technologies and products for commercialization in the consumer electronics industry. Also on the line today is Darren Campbell, lead engineer in ACT's custom products group. Darren works directly with customers to conceptualize, design, and analyze heat pipes, heat spreaders, and other thermal solutions for electronics with strict design requirements. With three years of thermal design experience at ACT, he has taken on numerous projects that have required strong thermal and mechanical design skills and hands-on management to develop these designs into prototypes and deliverable units. So now I'd like to hand the webcast over to our first speaker, Pete Ritt. Pete. Thank you, Billy. I'm Pete Ritt, and along with Darren Campo, we are delighted to be with you today. For today's webinar, we will be talking about heat pipes. Heat pipes are superconductors of heat, which are providing excellent thermal management for many applications in electronics cooling and many other military, medical, aerospace, and energy management markets. In today's webinar, we'll first review the basic principles of heat pipe operation. Then we'll explore some applications where the heat pipes are being used and see what kind of heat transfer and heat spreading benefits they can provide. Then we'll look a little bit in depth at some key design and modeling characteristics of heat pipes, and again, provide an example of modeling a heat pipe solution. Then we'll wrap up and hopefully take a few of your questions. Modern heat pipes have been around since the 60s, when they were developed at Los Alamos Laboratory and were initially used in military and aerospace applications. With the dramatic proliferation of electronic devices that has occurred since then, heat pipes have found many new applications, with laptop computers probably the best known one. As we will see, heat pipes are relatively simple devices conceptually, although they can provide significantly better heat transfer than metal conductors. As electronic devices become more powerful, but also more compact, Heat pipes are more frequently a critical part of the thermal management solution for many products in military lighting, medical, and renewable energy markets. Let's learn a little bit more about how they work. Heat pipes are sealed vacuum devices. They are housed in a metal tube. Inside the tube is a wick structure and a small amount of a working fluid. Most applications are copper tube, copper mesh, and water, but there are several other envelope materials, wick structures, and working fluid combinations. Heat pipes are passive, two-phase heat transfer devices that operate in a closed system. To work, a heat pipe must be in contact with a hot end or evaporator and a cold end or condenser, as can be seen in the schematic on the left. The delta T is the driving force for the heat transfer. The heat from the evaporator causes the working fluid to vaporize. The vapor then flows to the cooler end where it condenses to a liquid. The condensed liquid then returns to the evaporator by capillary force of the wick structure. In the schematic on the right, you can see a cutaway showing the heat pipe structure, including center vapor path and the liquid path along the wick structure. Let's now have a demonstration of a heat pipe. 
the metal tube sticking out of the center of the enclosure with the ACT logo on it is a standard copper rod. To the right of the rod is a copper water heat pipe. Both are painted with a temperature sensitive paint that is green when cold and yellow when warm. Both are connected to cold thermoelectrics below. The first step will be to move the copper rod from the cold thermoelectric to the warm one. You will begin to see the copper rod change color from green to yellow as it begins to heat up. Next, we'll move the heat pipe in the same way. As you will see, the heat pipe heats up and changes color very fast. When the heat pipe is returned to the cold thermoelectric, it also quickly returns to the green color. The copper rod does as well, but not nearly as fast. So now that we know a little bit about heat pipe operation, let's look at this, how this can be put to use. First of all, with different combination of envelope materials, wick structures, and working fluid, heat pipes can be used over a wide temperature range. From cryogenic to liquid metal, from minus 150 to 1000 degrees C. Because they are sealed vacuum devices, some working fluids can operate well beyond the nominal boiling point. Water, for example, can be an effective working fluid from 20 to 250 degrees C. By controlling the amount of working fluid and selecting the appropriate wick structure, heat pipes can restart after freezing. That is, when a copper water heat pipe is subject to temperature below freezing, it does not function as a heat pipe. However, when the temperature rises above freezing, they begin to operate normally. They are freeze-thaw tolerant. Also, with the right wick structure, heat pipes can operate against gravity. That is, they can, move away from the, they can move heat away from the hot evaporator, even when it is above the condenser. Typically, heat pipes can transfer heat 8 to 10 inches against gravity, although gravity-aided operation is generally preferred. In terms of advantages, since boiling and condensing are occurring at the same temperature, heat pipes can have effective conductivities of 10,000 to 200,000 watts per meter Kelvin. We can contrast that with copper, an often used conductor, which has a conductivity of around 400 watts per meter K. Other advantages include continuous passive operation, excellent isothermality characteristics, and quiet operation. One of the key benefits of heat pipes is heat transport. Heat pipes can be used to transfer heat to external sinks. They are capable of transferring heat over long distances with minimal delta T. We mentioned typical heat pipes can transfer heat 8 to 10 inches. Gravity-aided and other specialized heat pipes can transfer over longer distances. The typical delta T is about 2 to 5 degrees C over the length of the pipe. Bending and flattening enables increased geometric flexibility to design. You can see in the picture on the lower right Heat pipes, which are bent in three dimensions to transport heat away from an electronic component to a cold rail. Finally, heat pipes can be used to move heat away from the inside of an enclosure to exterior air cooling without subjecting the components to the outside environment. So when should one consider using heat pipes? Essentially, any time high conduction gradients are a major portion of the thermal resistance. We'll show you some examples later on. Heat pipes can be used to transfer heat and isothermalize components. In terms of benefits, heat pipes can be used to reduce the thermal management system size by providing more efficient heat transfer. They can also reduce system weight. Heat pipes are evacuated metal tubes which are lighter than similar size metal rods. They can also reduce required power. Heat pipes themselves require no power to operate and can reduce system hotspots. And in terms of flexibility, heat pipes can be formed to fit countless geometries. The typical bending radius for a heat pipe is three times the outside diameter, and they can be flattened to two-thirds the outside diameter. An operating heat pipe 
bent around a penny, can be seen in the lower right. Next, we'll look at high K plates, high K, K for thermal conductivity. High K plates are metal conduction plates with embedded heat pipes in them. Heat pipes are pressed into groove or drilled holes and soldered or epoxied into place. They offer similar strength and weight as the metal substrate, typically aluminum, with much higher thermal conductivities. They can be manufactured as thin as 72 thousandths. High K plates are often used to reduce hot spots or enhance fin efficiency in air-cooled heat sinks. The highlighted area shows a thermal conductivity range of 500 to 1200 watts per meter K. These values come from real-world applications where ACT went back to our models and adjusted the bulk thermal conductivity of the plate until the hotspots matched tested results. The range provided for thermal conductivity for these high K plates is mainly dependent on geometry as larger form factors can achieve higher effective thermal conductivities. This figure shows a comparison of an aluminum plate with the high K plate seen on the previous slide. In this example, the system was cooled using liquid cold rails. With straight aluminum, shown on the left, conduction gradients created hotspot temperatures exceeding maximum electronic temperatures. Going to a copper solution was also not desirable due to weight concerns. However, using a high K plate, the heat pipes are seen as horizontal and vertical lines. Higher thermal conductivity performance was achieved over aluminum or copper without significant weight to the aluminum solution. In this example, over a 20 degrees C hotspot temperature reduction was realized. At this time, we'll turn it back to Billy for a polling question. All right, it's time for our first poll question. It should appear on your screen now. The question is, does your company currently utilize or are you considering using heat pipes in your products? And your choices are A, yes, we use them now. B, we're considering using them within the next six months. C, we're considering using them in the next six to 12 months. Or D, you have no current plans to use them. So you can make your selection now by choosing the appropriate button on your screen. And as you answer that question, does your company currently utilize heat pipes in your products? I will hand the presentation back over to Pete. Thank you, Billy. Next, we'll talk about some real applications of heat pipes to demonstrate the many benefits heat pipes can offer. First, we'll look at using heat pipes to transfer heat to a remote sink. Then we'll look at an example of heat spreading to reduce an unacceptable thermal gradient in a card cage application. And finally, we'll look at an example of reducing size and weight of a heat sink by using heat pipes. In many lighting applications, the LED device must fit in a fixed space to accommodate a variety of customer requirements, which usually exclude thermal management considerations. A common example is a luminaire design where the ceiling or wall fixture are based on a pre-existing design using non-LED technologies. These designs commonly have both restricted space for heat dissipation through conduction and limited airflow to remove heat via convection. In cases where there is space to remotely dissipate the heat, heat pipes can be used to transport the heat from the device to a heat sink located elsewhere. This is called the remote sink. The remote sink solution has a heat pipe in direct contact with the LED device, a PCB or similar component at one end, which serves as the evaporator. At the other end, the heat pipe is connected to the heat sink, the condenser. A sketch of a conceptual design can be seen on the lower left. Here, two heat pipes are in direct contact with both the heat generating component at the bottom and the heat dissipating fins at the top. A wall or other enclosure can be placed in between the LED and heat sink to separate the two. In the example on the right, a single heat pipe is used to transfer heat from the source on the bottom to the heat sink above it. A thermal image on the right shows heat being transferred from the hot yellow LED device to the blue-green-yellow heat sink above it. The presence of green and yellow within the heat sink shows that the heat pipe is effectively transferring heat from the device to the radial heat sink fins. Heat pipes can efficiently transfer heat approximately 8 inches against gravity 
with minimal thermal gradient and even greater distances when gravity assisted. Note that the number, size, shape, and location of heat pipes would be specific to the design. Our second application is a conduction-cooled card guide where the power levels have been increased over the original legacy design. Increased power produced more waste heat, as you can see in the thermal image. The thermal gradient reached an unacceptable level on the top left section of the card guide. Liquid cooling this section was deemed too risky due to concerns about leaking. Although there is a pump liquid rail at the bottom of the card guide to ultimately remove the waste heat. So how can we eliminate this hotspot? Here we see a benefit of the high K technology we reviewed earlier. In this application, there was no opportunity to redesign the card base card cage structure. Fortunately, there was some available space behind the card cage where a high K plate could be bolted on. Heat pipes were strategically located on that plate to provide the most heat transfer in the hottest areas, transferring heat to the final heat sink at the bottom of the card cage. Let's now look at some results with this solution. Here we see thermal images of the original card guide with the new higher powered cards up on the left and then a larger thermal image with the high K plate bolt-on solution on the right. With the high K plate, the hotspots have been eliminated and the overall temperature gradient has been reduced significantly. Use of high K plate technology enabled a solution that could accommodate higher power levels without having to change the original card cage design. In our final example, we'll see how heat pipes can be used to reduce the size of a heat sink without compromising its performance. The third case, heat sink size, weight, and power, again uses the embedded heat pipe or high K plate, but takes the benefit in a different way. It is well known that placing a discrete heat source on a large metal heat sink will produce large thermal gradients as the heat slowly conducts and dissipates heat to the external fins. We have also discussed in this presentation that embedding heat pipes can increase the thermal conductivity from around 200 watts per meter K for aluminum to 500 to 1200 watts per meter K, offering the opportunity to reduce heat sink plate thickness and fin area. This approach can be implemented in a variety of outdoor applications, including large arrays, lighting, as well as some telecommunication devices. Let's now look at what kind of benefit we can expect. Here is a heat sink size and weight analysis with and without heat pipes. Total heat dissipation is 150 watt in both cases. The conventional metal heat sink is 12 inches long, weighs 9.6 pounds, and has a base thickness of 6 tenths of an inch. Introduction of five heat pipes, three in close proximity to the heat source, and another two a little further out for heat spreading, can have a dramatic effect. The overall length can be reduced to 10 inches, and the weight can be reduced to 6.3 pounds, an overall material reduction of nearly 35%. Here are some actual thermal images that demonstrate the improvement. The high K heat sink seen on the lower right more effectively spreads the heat as can be seen in the yellow area surrounding the source, even though the heat sink is shorter, lighter, and thinner. The improvement is directly attributable to the addition of heat pipes, which can be seen as red lines in that same picture. And now we'll turn it back to Billy for our final polling question. All right, this will be our last poll question. It should appear on your screen now. The question is, when looking for thermal management solutions, what is the single most important criteria your company uses to make a decision? And your three choices are A, cost, B, performance, and C, reliability. So again, you can make your selection by choosing the appropriate button on your screen. And I will hand the presentation back over to Pete. Pete? Thank you, Billy. Now that we have a basic understanding of heat pipes and have seen a few examples of how they are being used, 
will dig a little deeper to explore the design guidelines needed to ensure the heat pipe you install in your device operates as needed for the application. We'll determine power capacity and also provide guidelines to help integrate heat pipes into your system. Key input for designing a heat pipe solution is to know approximately how much power a heat pipe needs to transfer and what is the maximum ambient temperature range that the heat pipe will be operating in. In addition, it is ne necessary to know the orientation of the evaporator to the condenser. Is it higher, lower, or variable? Do we need to move heat with or against gravity? The least favorable orientation is usually the design target. Once determined, there are four main heat pipe performance limits that must be addressed, capillary, entrainment, sonic, and viscous. The capillary limit, which is usually the most critical, is the point that the wick structure can no longer carry the working fluid back to the evaporator. It is affected by wick structure, working fluid properties, acceleration environment, and orientation with respect to gravity. The entrainment limit is when the velocity of the vapor flowing back to the condenser is such that it is shearing the liquid off the wick structure and preventing it from reaching the evaporator. The sonic limit is when the acceleration environment that the heat pipe is in is so rapid that the vapor flow becomes choked and unable to reach the condenser. And the viscous limit, which like the sonic limit is principally an issue only at cold startup, is when the vapor pressure differential is so low that viscous forces become dominant. Of course, heat pipe designers are very familiar with these limits and can calculate them very quickly for all applications. As we just described, heat pipe performance is governed by several well-defined limits. For terrestrial applications, the first limit reached in most cases is the capillary limit which is the ability of the wick structure to overcome the various internal pressure drops created in the heat pipe. The figure shown here is a plot for all the limits, capillary entrainment, sonic, and viscous. As you can see, capillary limit, the red line, ultimately determines the capacity in this case. Of course, there are several heat pipe design considerations that affect these limits and must be accounted for as well. Key features include heat pipe diameter, length, orientation with respect to gravity, working fluid, and wick structure. It is, of course, important when designing with heat pipes to be confident that the heat pipe or multiple heat pipes can move your total power. ACT offers a free calculator on our website that can be used as a first approximation of the heat carrying capability for copper water heat pipes. This calculator makes assumptions on the wick structure, but is a good initial tool to predict specifically the capillary limit and more generally heat transfer capacity. Here's an example of using the heat pipe calculator. Required inputs are seen at the top in red. In this case, an 8-inch long heat pipe that has a 2-inch evaporator and a 2-inch condenser in a horizontal orientation needs to move 50 watts of heat over a temperature range between 60 and 80 degrees C. What diameter heat pipe is required to do this? As you can see, only the 6 millimeter and quarter inch diameter heat pipes are capable of moving this much heat over this temperature range. As we mentioned, this is a good approximation tool, but even if you're not getting the results you're looking for, please don't take this as the final word. Contact an experienced heat pipe designer for more accurate results. Now that we have an understanding of heat pipe performance capability, let's look at how it can be used to model a potential solution. The first step in almost all thermal management solution modeling efforts is to develop the thermal resistance network to determine what the heat pipe requirements are needed to deliver the necessary heat transfer. This is an example for a typical electronics cooling application. The thermal resistance always start with the heat generating component, the, the case temperature in this case, and ends with the heat being dissipated, the air temperature here. Each interface has a thermal resistance that must be accounted for and must be within the allotted thermal budget. 
In these networks, heat pipes will generally produce only a 2 to 5 degrees temperature rise across the vapor space inside the heat pipes. Once it has been confirmed that the overall thermal budget can accommodate the maximum heat loading of the device and that the heat pipe is the right solution for this application, we can move on to the specifics of the heat pipe design. Now that we know that the thermal resistant network provides adequate thermal management and we understand some of the heat pipe performance limits, we can explore how we might model the actual heat pipe. As we have seen, heat pipes use two-phase flow to transfer heat and could be modeled with a very elaborate algorithm with a high-end computational fluid dynamic software package. Fortunately, this is not required. Instead, heat pipes can be modeled quite accurately by using two simple steps. The first step is to run a set of 1D calculations that determine the maximum power the heat pipe can carry as a function of temperature in the range of interest. Second, instead of CFD two-phase flow simulations, heat pipe is modeled as a two-part solid. The heat pipe envelope and wick are lumped together and modeled based on their bulk effective material properties. The vapor space is modeled as a uniform solid material with a very high thermal conductivity, even as high as 1 million watts per meter K, that is calculated based on the design power transport and the expected vapor pressure drop. These results are then iterated to ensure that the maximum power is not exceeded on the final heat pipe design. A similar approach can be used for high K plates. As we discussed earlier, tested results show a thermal conductivity range of 500 to 1200 watts per meter K can be achieved depending on geometry. To quickly model high K plates, you replace your aluminum or base material conductivity with 600 watts per meter K. If you get favorable results, a high K plate solution with an optimized heat pipe and heat pipe array can usually be designed and fabricated. Summary. Today, we reviewed the fundamentals of heat pipes and some of their applications. Heat pipes, as we have seen, are superconductors of heat that require no power, produce no noise, and last for decades. We reviewed the basic principles of their operation, two-phase heat transfer inside a sealed device, which causes the heat pipe to isothermalize rapidly between the hot evaporator and the cold condenser. We discussed high K, high thermal conductivity conduction plates, in which by embedding heat pipes into aluminum plates, we can significantly increase thermal conductivity and provide improved heat transfer and heat spreading without increasing weight or decreasing structural strength. We then looked at three examples of using heat pipes. The first being using heat pipes to transfer heat to a remote sink, then provided a bolt-on high case solution for an existing card case design that had new cards with increased heat dissipation requirements, and finally, using heat pipes to reduce the size and weight of a heat sink without compromising performance. We then reviewed heat pipe performance limits and discussed that the capillary limit is usually the most important. We then modeled an application using a heat pipe, first within a thermal resistant network and then in a high K application. With the growing need for advanced thermal management solutions, heat pipes will likely be needed in more applications. We hope this webinar provided some guidance as to when and how they can be beneficially employed. Thank you for your attention, and we'll t now take some of your questions. Thanks, Pete. At this time, we'd like to begin our Q&A. So if you have a question, you can submit it by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. We're almost out of time, but I'd like to ask a few questions if we can. Uh, the first question here, and I'd also like to welcome back Darren Campo, lead engineer in ACT's custom products group. Darren, the first question, is there a limit in length for making heat pipes? All right. Uh, so in terms of a, a, the limit length, there is some, some sort of a practical limit. Um, for a longer wick length heat pipe, there will be some reduction in maximum power transport as you increase the length of that pipe due to the additional liquid pressure drop through the wick. Uh, so for diameters up to about a quarter of an inch, 
Uh, I'd say about the useful range for a typical wick structure is about two feet. Uh, larger diameter heat pipes, you could potentially be longer. Uh, if you're in a situation where you can use a thermosiphon, so you're always going to be gravity aided, uh, those heat pipes are typically uh, entirely length independent uh, due to how the governing equations only depend on the diameter. So you can have thermosiphons on the scale of five or six feet. What are the pros and cons of high K versus vapor chamber? That's a question that came in. Okay, very good. Uh, so a vapor chamber, uh, as I think as Pia covered in the webinar, is essentially like a two-dimensional heat pipe. If you think about a heat pipe moving heat in one direction, a vapor chamber essentially spreads it in two directions at once. Uh, they're typically a high-end device used for when you have a, an exceptionally high heat flux and you need to uh, spread a sort of a, a very small um, small uh, heat load area over a much larger area on the opposite side, and they are also very thin. Uh, the one downside to those is that they do have a much higher cost than a high K plate. They are also a bit more sensitive to temperature uh, due to the, uh, vapor ch uh, the vapor pressure of the working fluid. Uh, once, you, um, once you, say for water, get over about 100 degrees, uh, the vapor chamber typically has some pretty thin walls that can uh, pillow out on you. Uh, for a high K plate, um, we can, as, as I said before, they're going to have a lower cost of production. Uh, we can also make those in small, large, really any size uh, that you would need them. Uh, so they are definitely a, a great substitute when you don't uh, need that high-end uh, vapor chamber if you don't have an exceptionally high heat flux. Brian, this will have to be our last question today. Are there concerns with using heat pipes and high K plates in high vibration, sand and dust, and salt fog environments? No, there, there really isn't a, no concern there. Uh, we have uh, published a reliability gu uh, guide on our website. Uh, we have demonstrated uh, that in sort of uh, vi vibration scenarios that the heat pipe is still able to operate. Uh, also, in terms of really any environment, whether it's a salt fog or or even if it's just like a clean room environment, the uh, vacuum containment of the heat pipe is of utmost importance. So any heat pipe that leaves our facility, we always make sure uh, it does have a, the proper seal that will not uh, degrade over time. And so once we're able to produce a, a well-made heat pipe in, in, in that manner, uh, it can pretty much operate in any environment. Like I said, clean room or salt fog environment out in the desert, uh, they are used uh, considerably in uh, military applications where you would have uh, typically those very demanding uh, design requirements. All right, we'll end it there. That concludes today's webcast. Again, we have your questions, and if we did not get a chance to answer your question today, our sponsors will do their best to address them after today's presentation. So our thanks to Pete Ritt, Darren Campo, and everyone out there for joining us. And just a reminder, this webcast will be available on demand at www.techbriefs.com for the next 12 months. Have a great day.